Thank you very much. Good morning, and uh, thank you for attending. Uh, as uh, noted, I'll talk for about 25 to 30 minutes, and then we'll get into questions. And uh, just to kind of set things uh, up for you, uh, so you know who I'm, uh, who I am, or where the information is coming from, is introduced. I'm vice president of underwriting. Uh, I'm the individual that of Emco Insurance that analyzes risks, looks at claim settlements, uh, policy wording, and determines acceptance of risks, which is a combination of pilot experience with type of aircraft characteristics, limits, and values of the airplane. As far as my aviation background, uh, I got into uh, aviation as a uh, avocation and turned it into a vocation via insurance. Most of my pilot experience, I'm private, instrument rated, single engine land, is out in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming. I've done a little bit of flying in the Maryland area and then have audited some uh, training classes uh, for various types of aircraft. Most of my flying has been personal pleasure and uh, recreational flying. As mentioned, I've got 28 plus years of experience in aviation insurance. Uh, if I have a question on my homeowner's policy, I do what any good customer should do. I call the agent that handles my homeowner's policy and ask them the question. Uh, it's a different line uh, than what I work in every day with the aviation side, so I go to the experts on that, and I take care of the aviation side because I'm the expert in that. <clears throat> and using the term expert, um, I've got to throw in a comment. I used to tout myself as an expert all the time until someone said, well, Mike, you need to break down what that means. An X is someone that you hear from on the back of your alimony checks, and a spurt is simply a drip under pressure. So I've now dropped that moniker from my title. And uh, uh, just to say I work in aviation insurance. Uh, the information I'm presenting today is from Avemco Insurance Company. It's not FAA records. It's not all of our competitors. It's strictly from Avemco Insurance. So you need to understand that, one, it is somewhat limited data, but it's very valid. And Avemco is a direct writer of general aviation insurance, which means that if you buy a policy from Avemco, when you make a call, you're talking directly to the insurance company and to a sales underwriter that has the authority to change a policy, answer a question, interpret a policy for you. We do not deal through agents or brokers. Uh, Avemco Insurance Company itself, uh, we've been superior or A-plus rated by AM Best since 1977. That's briefly what that means is that uh, every year we're audited and uh, a third party comes in and says the insurance company has enough money to pay all of its current claims, all of its anticipated claims, and have the operating capital to stay in business. We don't need any bails outs or funds to uh, keep us going. If we have some kind of catastrophe, we've got that built into our program. So it's you do want to look at that with any insurance company that you buy because that kind of gets into are they going to be there when you really need them. Okay, now the overview of the seminar, so you know what to expect, <clears throat> is I'm going to run through the top 10 causes of loss. And again, these are from the Avemco claim files, so they may be different from what, excuse me, what you hear from the FAA or some other uh, pilot group. Uh, they are strictly what we have from our records. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about phases of operation of losses or phases of operation where you're doing something as a pilot or in some cases not doing something as a pilot and it causes a loss. And then lastly, we're going to look at pilot experience. So uh, not to offend anyone here, if I do it right, I've kind of offended all of you by the end of the presentation. Because if you feel like you're good in one situation, you'll probably get into the phase of operation or experience and find out that there are some things you need to work on. So let's get right into loss descriptions and, and losses. And so that you understand the chart going from left to right up there, I'm going to start at the top, the one we have the most claims in, and it's landing pilot error. And then the next thing where I pick on the region, I'm actually singling out the region of the U.S. with our experience that has the worst losses in that category, what their percent of claims are versus our national average. So to pick on any pilots from the West Coast, anyone here from the West Coast states other than myself? <clears throat> okay, I haven't offended anyone yet. They have 23% losses due to landing pilot error compared to our national average of 20.9. So something's going on in the western states where pilots are having landing errors. And when I talk about landing errors, the definition that we use in this is that it's basically a botched landing. It's a loss of control on landing. Uh, the landing gear, they landed short, they landed long. This doesn't have to do with gear up losses yet. We'll get to that in a little bit in the presentation. Um, 
but uh, these are just something where the pilot did something wrong. They couldn't manage their speed, they had too much energy, couldn't handle the short uh, field crosswind, something like that. <clears throat> Next loss that we have, oddly enough, when people say, well, weather never affects me, is weather is on a national average is 17.6% of our losses. If you're in the central states, 25% of our losses are related to weather. There's no pilot involvement with this at all. This is strictly wind, hail, theft, fire, or wind, hail, theft, fire, if it's a wildfire. Covers earthquake, which is not excluded under our policy, but I have to tell you that we have not paid a single earthquake claim that I'm aware of. It just doesn't happen. Now, if you read your homeowner's policy, you'll see that flooding is often excluded in your policy. That's not excluded in our aviation policy, so that is covered. And uh, Hurricane Ike actually gave us quite a few flooding losses down in the uh, southern states. But if you're in the central states, take a look at your airplane and figure out what can I do to protect it from the weather, because that's 25% of our losses in that territory. Okay, now we get back into human factors. Taxi losses. How tough or difficult is it to taxi an airplane? Well, once you learn to steer, steer with your feet, shouldn't be too difficult at all. But as you can see, on a national average, a little over 10% of us can't taxi an airplane very well. And for some reason, if you're in the Atlantic states, and that's pretty much, pardon me, pretty much uh, going from D.C. north up to the uh, Canadian border, you're a little bit worse than the rest of us, 13%. And our speculation is, when we talk to our claimants on this, is that they're generally distracted about something else. They're trying to program a GPS. They're trying to draw down a clearance. They're trying to copy uh, an ATIS. Uh, they're checking fuel, they're looking at something else, they're trying to pick up a cell phone, any number of things. The other thing that we found is that a lot of pilots have lost the concept of where their wingtips are and their tail is. And we get an awful lot of damage where we have a wingtip that creases a spinner. In fact, that hits the top ten, and we'll get to that in a little bit, where they're just not watching where the ends of their airplane are and they hit fuel islands, corners of hangars, other parked airplanes. So we need to pay attention to uh, taxi losses, particularly if you're in the Atlantic states. Okay, loss of engine power. Not a whole lot on the national level. 10% uh, on the west coast, um, probably because there's more seasonal flying on the west coast on there. Now it's interesting on the loss of engine power, the initial report comes in is that uh, the engine lost power, I landed out in a field somewhere. And when we get through looking with the claim and adjusting it, the adjuster goes out and says, you know, there wasn't any fuel left in any of the fuel tanks, they weren't ruptured, and there wasn't any gasoline in the ground, so we don't have any EPA cleanup. Now, that's good news to the insurance company because uh, EPA cleanups can be very expensive and they're not excluded under our policy. The bad news is, is the pilot just flat ran out of gas. Uh, if there is fuel in the tanks and there's some kind of a fuel starvation where there's a blockage, you know, we still take care of that. That's a small number of, of losses that go out there. One of the things that's kind of interesting is carb ice, which is often blamed for loss of engine power. And it's very difficult to prove or disprove because the evidence melts. Once the plane starts moving, you still have that hot engine, you don't have the cold air coming in, carb ice disappears, all the evidence is gone, and all we can do is look at the atmospheric conditions as to was it conducive for carburetor icing. Now I will tell you from personal experience, not that I was the pilot, we had one case where the evidence did not melt. It was in a Mooney out in Montana. It uh, had a new air filter on it. The air filter iced over, the plane crashed, the passenger and the pilot survived, they were rescued and the ice was still on the uh, air filter carburetor when the rescue team got there. So that went into a uh, freezer, was analyzed, and they, out of that, a um, not a notum, but a um, airworthiness directive came out. If you're going to use such an air filter, you had to modify the system a little bit. But that was one case that I know of where we had the carb ice, and it did not, the evidence did not disappear on us. Okay, negligence of a third party. Uh, the owner of the airplane is not involved with this. You show up uh, out to do your pre-flight and you find some kind of a damage to the aircraft. And it's not damage the, where the elevator or an aileron matches where the cabinet or a post is in your hangar. This is truly, there's odd paint somewhere on the back of your airplane. There's damage there. There's a standard crease in the spinner where we have a plane that kind of taxied by, creased your spinner. 
which gets back to item number three there, taxi pilot error. Someone else just kept on going, and now you're stuck with the loss. So out of this, it's not a huge difference, but you know, 5.7% of our claims, 6% again in the Atlantic states. Maybe we have some dishonest pilots in the Atlantic states, or they don't know how to taxi. It matches with their 13% versus the national average. But this is damage done that you have no control over other than where you park your aircraft. And I want to point out, uh, any of you that have signed hangar tie-down lease agreements or airport lease agreements or tie-down agreements, you've waived your rights under the policy to, under your agreement, to go back against the airport if they do some damage to your airplane. It's not anything to get super concerned about because we, as the insurance company, put an endorsement on the policy that says, yeah, we're going to pay those losses regardless, and we agree not to subrogate. But if your plane is tied out and you can get an infield tie-down area that's away from grass and things, you're likely to cut down your possibility of having some kind of a third-party loss because a mowing machine, throwing a rock, damaging your airplane, it's covered under our policy, but that's going to be a third-party of claim loss. So if you can keep to a safer place, stay away from active taxiways, you can decrease your chances of having that kind of a loss. Okay, takeoff for uh, pilot error. And um, Great Lakes is 5%, national average is 3.7. Most of the losses, anyone here from the Great Lakes area on there? Okay, we've got one. Jim, I'll pick on you by name. In the springtime, when you start flying again, if you haven't been active in the spring, I highly recommend that you get with a flight instructor and go out and do some crosswind takeoffs and crosswind landings. The uptick that we see in the Great Lakes area is that after a non-flying portion of the year, they go out, they get a nice day, they get a crosswind. The pilot operating handbook says, yep, the airplane can handle this. You don't do the mental checklist. Can I as a pilot handle this? And the first thing you do is you have a takeoff loss. So we have crosswinds. We have short field, soft field techniques that need to be practiced and brought up. If you checked your gross uh, takeoff weight in the center of gravity, uh, we had a one claim where um, the fellow regularly went to a family reunion, had been doing it for years and years. One year he went to depart, didn't make it. Turned out with the investigation, the airplane was over gross takeoff weight and severely out of its uh, center of gravity. And the pilot's response was, hadn't had a problem 10 years before. So just because you got lucky 10 years, don't try and push it for the 11th. Take care of those things to ensure that you're OK on your takeoffs. Density altitude is another issue. It's more of an issue in the uh, mountain states, but density altitude with high humidity can affect any of us. And we do need to take that into account. Okay, Now we get to the one where a lot of people talk about, well, this is all retract problems. And this one, actually, it is. 3.5% um, of our claims, some reason on the West Coast, 4% of our claims are a gear malfunction on landing. Now, in the accident investigation, we've determined that there was something that broke, failed, was corroded, jammed, that prevented the gear from extending. Even with the emergency gear extension procedure, the gear just wouldn't come down. This does not count the standard thing where the person broke something by slamming it into the runway or anything like that. This is, pardon me, post-mortem uh, examination that says, yeah, there was a link pin, there was a corroded box, there was a crack in a landing gear box, et cetera. And that's about 4%. So maintenance is pretty critical if you have a uh, retractable gear aircraft. Um, and actually, if there are a couple of tailwheel airplanes where we've seen issues in, uh, on Cessna 206s. If you do a lot of backcountry flying into rough strips, uh, check your gearboxes periodically because we've had claims where a gearbox has started to crack, it's corroded, and then at some point one of the main gears gives out and then you've got a ground loop prop strike and depending upon the value of the airplane, the total loss of the aircraft. So just because you have a fixed gear aircraft, don't neglect uh, inspection of the uh, landing gear. Okay, theft and vandalism. Uh, actually, that's part of the top 10 here. It's 3.3 uh, in the nation, 4% in the south. Uh, not sure why it's 4% in the south uh, on there. Uh, don't know about the, the character of people. But the theft and vandalism, this isn't negligence of a third party. This is where someone has actually gone out and done damage intentional to an airplane. Most of it is damage to paint. 
Uh, we had one case where uh, kids uh, were out walking on the wings and walking around on the top of the airplane, sliding down the windshield because it was a lot of fun. Um, we knew it was vandalism. We knew it was damage. We took care of our customers. And lo and behold, guess what we saw on YouTube? Five kids walking on an airplane, <laughs> sliding down a windshield, etc. So we notified the local police department and hopefully they took care of it uh, so it doesn't happen again. Occasionally we've had some bullet holes in the airplanes. Uh, we don't know if those are intentional or if someone just was an errant shot while out hunting for game and it went through a hangar wall and into an airplane. Um, and uh, we do include in Alaska the occasional bear looking for food in an airplane. That would be a vandalism uh, type claim. Uh, and we do get those periodically, so if you're up in Alaska, make sure you wash all the fish smell out of your airplane, make sure the food's hanging up in a bag out of a tree and not in your airplane. Okay, then we have hangar rash. And uh, it's not a whole lot, it's 2.7%, 3% in the Great Lakes area. And the key to avoiding this is if you're in a hangar and you're going to load it up with sofas, refrigerators, and cabinets, make sure you've got plenty of clearance between your aileron, rudder, uh, the elevators, etc. And if you are got the, the time or the things, put good lines on your hangar, pay attention to them, and move the plane that way. Don't taxi into the hangar and don't taxi out of the hangar under its own power. We've had a couple claims where someone couldn't, their, see their motor tug didn't work, they had a large airplane so they thought not a problem, we'll just fire up one engine, it was a Baron, and we'll just taxi out and off and away. Well they got part way out and it destroyed part of the plane. So uh, don't uh, do those types of things, watch where you're going in your, uh, in, in your hangar. Okay and then last, is the gear up. How many people would have thought, well I've already given you the 10, I should have asked this question first. How many people think gear up is number one on our list? Everyone would have put their hands up. That's what everyone writes about the most. And now this gear up, and you have to pay attention to it because these are extremely expensive. We've got a propeller, we've got an engine, we've got the landing gear, you generally have flaps, probably have some aileron damage, and we have belly skin damage. A gear up landing can easily total out a $100,000 airplane. So they're not trifle losses, but they are 3% in the West Coast, 2.5% overall. And these are ones where the pilot, when they get out of the, the mishap, said, yeah, I got distracted, I just plain forgot, got out of my sink uh, on it, uh, had a distraction. Or after we do the investigation and the pilot said, well, the gear didn't extend and I thought I had the three green and I did the go around and the emergency procedures and we find absolutely nothing wrong with the landing gear. The classic, you put the plane up, you flip the lever and the gear drop right out. That's a, a gear up uh, with a pilot error. So the key to this one is checklist, checklist, and checklist. And if you get distracted, go back to the start of the checklist and start over. I had a customer um, out in Oregon that uh, had uh, Piper Aero flew it successfully for 23 years without a gear up. Finally called me and said, well, Mike, I had my gear up. I said, okay, well, not a problem, Ray. I will take care of it. I need some details. We'll get that submitted. And what it was is he was at an uncontrolled airport, which now with the towers closing, let's pay attention to this story. Uncontrolled airport, everyone was landing to the south. There were three planes in the pattern. They were all calling in. And uh, someone came in from the north and called a long straight in which, depending upon which articles you read in various magazines, is okay or not okay. The trouble is our customer didn't say, okay, I'm out of here, I'm going to wait for him to come in, I'm going to go around, go through my checklist. He decided to get on the radio and tell the straight-in pilot what, how unprofessional he was. I'll phrase it that way. And unfortunately, in chewing out the pilot that supposedly had committed the error in coming on the long straight-in, he forgot to extend his gear. He landed gear up and closed the damn airport. So here's a guy that supposedly did everything, but then he closed the airport, whereas the one that caused a problem with the traffic didn't. So it's, and he admitted it was just checklist, checklist, checklist. He should have said, you know, I needed to go back at the start and run through everything. Okay, so those were the top 10 causes of loss. So hopefully you can look around and say, okay, I've done this, haven't done this, I need to watch out for this. So let's talk about phases of operation now. 
in the phases of operation, these are Avemco's definitions. So they're, you're not going to see them in the NTSB reports. You're not going to see them in the FAA report. And our definition of a takeoff, as far as this presentation, is the beginning of the takeoff run with the intent to take off. During flight, it's after you've transitioned out of your takeoff. You're, you may be staying in the pattern to do touch and goes, but you're off of your straight out departure. You've turned crosswind. Uh, landing is generally defined as you're on final, generally a short to a medium final, not a 15 mile final, but that's where we define uh, landing for ours. And then taxi will be movement anywhere on the airport grounds under the airplane's own power. And then the ground is the catch all for anything else. So think of ground as not being takeoff, not during flight, not landing, and not during taxi. And now what I've done on this to try and help everyone, I've given a region, I've given a type of airplane where we see it has the highest number of accidents for that phase, and then I've given a region for all aircraft. So the way we read this is the um, all claims is going to be our gray thing. So across all of our claims, 6 out of 100, think of it as 6 out of 100 are takeoff related. Out of that, Tailwheel aircraft, if I have 100 claims involving tailwheel aircraft, I know that eight of them are going to be takeoff accidents. And for some reason, out of the Great Lakes, which kind of ties in with the uh, prior information, is if I have 100 claims, 10 of them are going to occur in the Great Lakes involving the takeoff. OK, so now we've got the in-flight. And unfortunately, Great Lakes is still leading the case. And uh, Jim, you're the only one here from Great Lakes so far. Do you want to retract that admission or stay with it here? You're good? OK. <clears throat> no. But we see that uh, during the flight phase, uh, we've got 17% of our claims um, by a tricycle fixed gear. And this will be anything like your Cessna 172s, your Piper Cherokees, 206s, anything like that. And our speculation is that these planes are starting to be used for more serious cross-country type work. And they're going to run into some problems with crossing through weather fronts, uh, density altitudes, long loads, lots of people, pilot fatigue. Uh, why it's in the Great Lakes at 18 uh, percent, I honestly don't know. Maybe that we see this where they haven't flown maybe all season. They get a nice day in the spring, and they want to come to sun and fun. And they get three quarters of the way here. So that would be uh, a uh, during flight uh, type loss. OK, during landing. No one should be surprised by the tail wheel. Now, that's one reason why insurance companies charge more for tail wheel aircraft, as we know that they're going to have more losses out of it. Um, and we see that it's the, when we get through this, this will be a, a leader overall for uh, all of our last losses that come up are landing. We just seem to have trouble with landings. And we need to do good pre flights, but if we go out and practice our landings in all conditions short field, soft field, density altitudes, crosswinds. Um, that will eliminate an awful lot of claims, which would help protect your insurance premiums. Okay, now taxi. This kind of surprised us. Um, on there in the tricycle fixed gear high performance, we went to the FAA definition of a high performance aircraft, and we see that uh, nationwide 11 percent of our claims involve taxi and high performance or uh, in uh, aircraft. 10 per 16 percent of that are high performance type aircraft, and 13 percent are attributed to the Atlantic states. Um, again, the speculation we have and the pilot statements are, I was distracted doing something else. As we get into a higher performance airplane, we've generally got fancier avionics. They're being used for more cross country flight. There's more things going on. Um, an instructor made a, an absolutely brilliant statement to me, and if I had $3 million to invest, I'd start a company to do this. And his comment was, what piston-powered aircraft need is an APU. And that way, you can fire up the APU, you can program all of your flight avionics, and then you can start your engine without losing all of that. Right now, in a piston-powered aircraft, you have to start the engine, and that starts the Hobbs meter and the uh, tack, and that starts running time on your engine, and you don't want to waste time programming when you can multitask and taxi and program at the same time. The trouble is we can't multitask by programming and taxiing at the same time. So get your programming set up, 
just count on when I taxi, I need to take a look at what's going on outside of the airplane because a little bit I spend in engine hours or time on the ground taxiing can save me a deductible on a claim and a loss of use of the airplane. Okay, then the ground all other, um, that's 48% uh, of our claim, or excuse me, 39% nationwide, tricycle fixed gear. Our reasoning for that is that an awful lot of these airplanes have a lower value, an awful lot of them are tied out. So they're going to be subject to more adverse weather conditions, wind, hail, um, theft, vandalism, again, anything that's not the takeoff during flight, landing, or taxi. So if you've got a tied out airplane, do what you can to secure it. Gust locks uh, make a big difference, uh, canopy covers, things like that. Getting a good tie down spot on the airport. All right, <clears throat> so let's move into the third uh, topic here and then we'll get into the questions. And this is make and model hours. Now, what we've done on this, again, this is just strictly of EMCO data, is we've broken it down to pilot experience. Now, we haven't picked on student pilots versus private versus commercial. This is strictly pilot experience related to the make and model aircraft. So we looked at the primary transition, 0 to 10 hours, 11 to 50, 51 to 100, and so on. And once we got over 500 hours in the airplane, we just kind of lumped those all in a, in a group. And then I've got an average for you on that. But if we go back to our phases again, you can see that if you're new to an airplane, you have a 23, you know, 23 out of 100 claims are going to come during that 0 to 10 during your training transition period. And uh, I get a comment from a lot of our customers that are moving into an airplane. They're going, well, why are you charging me so much? And I go, well, you don't have any experience in the airplane. And they go, yeah, but I'm flying with an instructor. And I go, yes, you are, because I'm going to require it because I know what kind of training you need or experience before you can successfully fly on your own. The bad news is instructors don't catch all the accidents. So we do see quite a few takeoff losses here uh, in the initial checkout phase. This zero loss is in the 101 to 250 is interesting. Um, kind of the thought that we have on it is we've got a pilot that knows the airplane, has been around for a while, and they are conservative in their judgment. And if it's exceeding the capabilities of the airplane, they delay their departure or takeoff, they're doing their weight and balance, they're doing their gross takeoff uh, tests. They're paying an awful lot of attention to what they have. We think the 500 hour or 251 pilots and above, they're starting to get a little cavalier again. I've done this, it's a 182, I'm flying by myself, I've got a suitcase and I'm guilty of this when I was uh, traveling in the Northwest. I don't need to do a weight and balance because I know I've got 60 gallons of fuel. I'm the only one in it. If I put a case of oil in the back, that'll help balance the airplane and I'm good to go. I was a prime candidate for having a density altitude takeoff issue and if something shifted, a center of gravity issue. Okay, during flight, we see, we see an uptick with the uh, 101 to 250. We see a huge uptick with the 11 to 50. So they've completed their training or their transition period and now they get to use that new airplane for what they bought it for. They want to take a trip to Sun and Fun, Oshkosh, Arlington, the San Juan Islands, the Keys, whatnot, and they now start to get into a little bit of trouble because they're venturing out of their home base in a new airplane and they may be caught with a different situation. Uh, if anyone is uh, considering going into Angel, Fly Angel Fire New Mexico, uh, I strongly suggest that you do an awful lot of crosswind work before you go there, an awful lot of density altitude work when you go there, and be sure and have an alternate because we see an awful lot of losses in Angel Fire New York, in New Mexico, and it is basically winds and density altitudes. Okay, in landings, we're not too surprised by the zero to ten. You'd think the 101 or even the 250 and above should be virtually zero. They're supposed to be the aces of the base. They should be real good, which means you start to do more of what the pilot operating handbook can do. You can handle more of a crosswind, you think. You can handle maybe you got a slight downwind on landing. Uh, you don't need a checklist. You've had it enough that you mentally go through your gumps, and that works every single time until someone does a long straight in from the opposite direction and then you get lost and you have a gear up. But uh, you do need to uh, pay attention to your landings, uh, runway length, uh, runway altitude, any obstructions off the end, any obstructions on the approach side, 
at what point do you initiate a go-around to have a successful go-around versus just ending up in the trees at the end of the runway. And then during taxi, again, this should be zero, you would think. The zero to 10, we can understand a little bit of that. The instructor, if they're checking out a pilot, may be pointing out something in the airplane, so we have two heads inside the aircraft. Uh, the 11 to 50, they don't have an instructor. They're very nervous about the airplane. They pay an awful lot of attention. Uh, anything over that, we start to see they're playing with avionics. They're picking up ATIS. They're calling fuel if they're coming back in. They're asking for progressives, or they're explaining to their passengers what they're going to do and how much fun they're going to have on the trip until they have the taxi lost, and then they have to scrub the trip. OK, and then ground. Really no surprise here. Uh, the only reason the 0 to 10 is only 20% is you're in that time zone as a pilot for a very short period. Uh, everyone else that owns an airplane for a longer period, if you've got some kind of, if you're tied out or something, there's the potential of the loss that's there. But it's something to, to pay attention to as you uh, own your airplane. So with that, I will open it up to any questions. It can be about the presentation. It can be about Avemco. It can be about insurance. And if I can answer it, I will. If I can't, I'll tell you I can't, and I'll try and get an answer back. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the question is, if the, essentially, if the pilot does something that violates a federal aviation regulation or a pilot operating handbook or exceeds the uh, criteria of the aircraft, does the insurance company deny the policy? Um, depends on the policy. The, one of the things you want to look at in an insurance uh, policy when you're purchasing it, does it have anything that refers to a blanket uh, FAR exclusion or any vague wording. We saw one policy uh, once that said uh, there's no coverage if the airplane's flown into an airfield not adequate for the airplane. Uh, well, you know, if the person doesn't destroy the airplane, the field obviously was adequate. If they destroyed it, it could be deemed inadequate. So you do need to look at it. Uh, the um, blatant ad for Avemco, we don't have any kind of an exclusion like that. We'll take a look at it. The first one will be covered as long as all other conditions are met. Now, we may come back and say, we don't want to insure you in the future once your plane's repaired, or we may turn around and say, you need to go and work with, and we may even require a specific school or instructor to get you recertified or rechecked out before we'll continue insurance. But uh, personally, it's fairly infrequent that I've heard of that. Uh, but again, you do need to look at the contract of the policy because that is what will be uh, the determining judge in a coverage or non-coverage of a claim. Uh, okay. The question was, we didn't have anything related to weather in flight. Uh, we don't have that broken out yet. Uh, the information that we've been mining through all of our claims, uh, we've been working on this project for about nine months now, and the more we refine it, the more information we'll be able to get. At some point, there'll be just too few of numbers to make anything uh, substantial out of it. So we said, okay, let's take the top ten big one. So if you're looking at the in-flight phase, yeah, you have to assume there's some weather-related things in there. There's pilot fatigue, uh, anything like that, terrain, territory. Uh, you notice I didn't talk about uh, controlled flight into terrain, which would be something that would fall under the uh, in-route or in-flight uh, phase of our, our losses. Uh, we are working on that, and if, again, we can get numbers that we feel are credible uh, on that, then we'll certainly work that into uh, future presentations. Because, I mean, one of the goals here is that, uh, one, adjusting claims is our business. Adjusting claims really isn't a lot of fun because we know there's a lot of pain and heartache and often injury involved with the, uh, the customer. We'd just as soon be proactive, sell you an insurance policy that will cover truly an accident, which is an unplanned, unforeseen event. If we can inform you of things that you need to be aware of so that you can change a pattern before an accident occurs, that's really what we want to do. And if we can get that information, we'll certainly share it. Yeah? What's the threshold we have to 
Uh, the question is subrogation against renters. Uh, I'm going to get a disclaimer in here. We no longer write commercial insurance. I used to handle commercial insurance when I was with National Aviation Underwriters and when Ovemco wrote it, so I'm pat I'll, I'll talk off of history on that. Um, <clears throat> the short answer is you can't squeeze blood out of a turnip or water out of a stone. So in subrogation, a lot of times a company has to look at, will it cost us more to subrogate than what we'll get back? And how much work is there to subrogate against it? Now what subrogation does, for anyone that's not familiar with it, it means that if an insurance company, and I'm going to pick on you as Helen with having a, an FBO, she's got a commercial policy that protects her business, I rent an airplane from her and I go out and I wreck it. It's my fault. It was strictly pilot air. Her company protects her and you can think of rental cars the same way. Her company protects her, and then her insurance company will look around and say, well, who is really negligent or who's liable for the loss? If it wasn't a mechanical failure, a breakdown of the airplane, it falls back on the pilot. So after her company has made her whole, her company can say, well, Helen paid insurance premiums to protect her, but not to protect Mike Adams, so therefore we're going to go after Mike Adams. Now, if I have a renter's insurance policy, they're going to you know, write a letter right away because there's coverage there. There'll be some kind of a settlement negotiated. If there isn't other insurance available to me, they may look at my wherewithal and my assets, and I've got to tell you as a vice president of underwriting, they're not going to subrogate against me. You know, it's fact of life. But if you do have assets or other coverages, they may subrogate against you for a portion of the, uh, of the loss and negotiate some kind of a settlement on that. Now the subrogation doesn't apply strictly to renting a commercial airplane. Um, and I don't want to get into another topic because I'm going to put in an ad here for our next presentation. We do 10 myths of insurance uh, at 1 o'clock this afternoon. We talk about renter's insurance and subrogation. If anyone wants to attend that, you're more than welcome. Uh, if you're not, uh, subrogation can actually occur against any pilot that is not a policyholder or an owner of the airplane. So even if you had a personal use policy, I met the open pilot or any pilot warranty, I was flying the airplane. Depending upon how your policy contract is written, if I damage the airplane, I could be subrogated against even though I'm a permissive user and I'm not renting the airplane from you. If I'm a named insured, then because I'm insured under the policy, they can't subrogate against me. But there's a distinction between a named insured and an approved pilot. So what you really want to look at is if you're flying someone else's airplane, is you want your own non-owned policy or you want to make sure you're a named insured pilot under the policy. If you're a named pilot, that doesn't guarantee that you're insured and doesn't guarantee you won't be subrogated against. Yeah, question in the back. Florida does a massive amount of flight training. How do we rank with regard to other states in terms of accidents that the flight is from? Uh, Y'all heard the question, everyone heard the question about how do you rank, how does Florida rank with uh, accidents with the instructor on board? Uh, I don't have those figures broken out, but I can tell you that because of the weather down here and the amount of flight activity, Florida is one of our larger, larger loss states as far as frequency and severity. And uh, we, as an underwriting company, we do rate appropriately for that and put in the training requirements. But uh, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have the specific on there, but you do want to make sure if you're taking instruction, use an instructor that has experience in the airplane, uh, nothing against the FAA, but any pilot that's got a CFI single engine land tailwheel endorsement can instruct in any single engine land tailwheel aircraft in high performance that have a high performance sign off. They don't require that they have make and model experience. We as an insurance company is at least the VEMCO requires that your instructor have make and model experience and you as the customer paying someone to check you out in an airplane really do need to demand that the instructor that's instructing you knows everything they have to know about that airplane uh, to give you an adequate checkout and keep you safe. It's a, you don't go to a podiatrist for brain surgery. Uh, you shouldn't go to an instructor for a specific checkout in an airplane where the instructor has not flown or instructed in that airplane themselves before. 
So yeah, question or. I have very rough statistics. Um, yeah, Vimco uh, supports the WINGS program a couple of ways. One is we give a premium credit for any of our insureds that do participate in the WINGS program, both knowledge and uh, the flight phase. And then any of you that have uh, earned your WINGS, uh, we're the company that has uh, sent out the uh, WINGS to you and, and incurred that cost to uh, keep the program going. Uh, as far as the number of uh, participants in their last record versus not, uh, unfortunately, uh, and this has been one of the frustrations with the, uh, the FAA, is of all of the pilots and plane owners out there, a relatively small percentage of uh, pilots do participate in the WINGS program. Uh, but based on that little bit of information that we have, we do see a better loss ratio with our customers that do participate regularly in the wing, excuse me, WINGS program. Uh, and that's one reason why we support it. Uh, you know, recurrent training on an annual basis, we'd love to get it at six months, but we'll take the annual, does make a difference uh, with our uh, customers. And you had a question there. Okay, the, the question uh, has to do with all of the claims dollars that Avemco pays. Uh, roughly what portions would go to liability losses and what portions would go to uh, hull damage losses. Uh, and that's pretty easy to calculate because if you look at your um, premium and under a VEMCO policy and most others it's going to give you a break out of the liability premium versus the hull. Uh, we base those premiums on the claims we pay. So roughly out of a, I'll pick an, an even thousand dollar premium policy, there's going to be about three hundred and fifty dollars that we apply for liability coverages and the other 650 that we pay for uh, hull damages. So it's uh, not quite, you know, one-third, two-third, but that's very close to what we pay on settlements for damages. Uh, we do have liability claims. Uh, often they're quite severe. They're fairly infrequent. The majority of claims that we see have to do with the uh, hull damage. So okay, did that answer the question for you? Okay. Uh, any other Questions out there? Okay, well that, uh, if you do have something that comes up, I'll be here through Thursday noon. Um, we've got booth C56 over in the hangar where we've got underwriters there. And uh, give us a ring at uh, the 800 number or avemco.com and I'll respond promptly. So.